thanks, Alison. And um, although you said never say that this is your last event, <laughs> I wanted to particularly thank Alison for uh, chairing this event, um, particularly because tomorrow is your very last day at ODI, yes. so we're really honoured um, that you're finishing up with, 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 uh, with our event. Um, Annalisa and I are actually going to bat this presentation between us. I'm going to start off by presenting the sort of rationale for the study. Um, and then <coughs> Annalisa will talk to you about some of the key findings on the, on the quantitative side. And then I'll talk about some of the key findings from the three case studies that we did. Um, I'd also just like to say before we start, many thanks to DFID and to OzAid who have co-financed this report and without whose support we, <coughs> we wouldn't have been able to do any of this. So many thanks to those two organisations. Um, just the outline. <coughs> okay, <coughs> as I mentioned, so I'll cover background and motivation. Annalisa will explain the traditional uh, and non-traditional development assistance, the concepts and the, and the methodology and our key findings on the volume of those flows. Um, we'll then talk about the case studies and then we'll have some conclusions and, and policy recommendations at the end. So firstly, <coughs> why did we want to do this study? Um, Alison has touched on this a little bit, um, but it is very well known that the development cooperation landscape is changing. It seems you can't move for five minutes in the aid business without people talking about new actors, new flows, new mechanisms and so forth. But when we actually started looking at the literature, we realised that most of the literature is written A, from a global perspective, and B, very often from a donor perspective, and often from a, a DAC donor perspective. So there's a lot about contrasting DAC aid with South-South cooperation and this sort of thing. Um, but actually the country perspective seemed to be a little bit missing. So what we really wanted to understand is what are the country's priorities? What are the experiences at, at country level in managing the new aid landscape? Does it bring a lot of new opportunities or does it bring a lot of new challenges or is it a bit of both? We also particularly wanted to start um, from a neutral starting point when it came to the, the Paris aid effectiveness agenda. We are very interested here in aid quality. We did spend a lot of time asking governments about what's more important to them in terms of the quality of the assistance they receive. But we didn't want to go in and say, how do all these different flows measure up to the Paris Declaration uh, principles? We were very keen to understand what countries wanted and then to, to assess the different flows um, against those, those uh, priorities. So let me hand over to Annalisa now around defining uh, non-traditional development assistance. So how does the new development assistance landscape look like? To do so, we needed to kind of provide a sort of taxonomy and distinguishing uh, traditional and non-traditional development assistance flows. Just an initial caveat, we didn't want to introduce another taxonomy, another classification. This is really to kind of give the sense of the magnitude of the new flows, but most importantly to inform our case study research. There are other colleagues out there that are doing this kind of exercise, development initiatives in particular, and as a kind of initial point, it's difficult to kind of distinguish between traditional and non-traditional, because traditional donors might be innovative and non-traditional donors might be out there for a long time, but this is really a shortcut. So defining non-traditional development assistance flows. We're talking about cross-border flows to developing countries, so we're excluding domestic resource mobilization. We needed to kind of concentrate the focus of the analysis. We're talking about flows that have a public or a philanthropic motive. In other words, we're kind of excluding flows that have a poorly for-profit motive, FDI remittances with a clear focus on household expenditure. And uh, we're considering flows with some levels of concessionality. In other words, we don't use the strict uh, ODA kind of requirements uh, for uh, loan classification, uh, concessional loans, the 25% grant element. These are three criteria to identify development assistance, but what does distinguish the non-traditional parties around the funding or delivery mechanisms that differ from traditional bilateral debt donors and multilateral uh, development assistance. These, are, these criteria are, are arbitrary, so, and it's a very kind of a, um, classification that is open to refinement. But the flows, uh, uh, next slide, sorry, Roman. And the flows <coughs> that are meeting these requirements are essentially described, uh, first of all, by the darker green side. Non-traditional uh, development assistance flows are flows from non-DAC countries. We classify philanthropic assistance 
climate finance, global vertical health funds like Gavi, the Global Fund, and social impact investment. We consider in a separate category, you will see in the report, we consider the sort of uh, upper bound estimates uh, where uh, we included the other official flows. Uh, we consider them separately because uh, most of them uh, belong to kind of traditional donors and they, in the way they're managed, they're very, mo very much like traditional flows, but they don't meet necessarily ODA concessionality requirements. And most importantly, we will see in the case studies, there are some of the low income countries that are graduating into middle income status. They will probably be assessing this kind of flows. And as a caveat before looking into the figures, we are looking from the country perspective. So we are very much interested in the channels rather than the sources themselves. Just to give you an example, the Global Fund uh, is financed by philanthropic organizations, uh, bilateral duck donors, non duck donors. So when we're looking at these flows and we estimate them, we look at the destination end and we try to net out this kind of cross relationship between the different actors. Next slide. So how does the kind of <coughs> double picture look like? Here we kind of present a sort of first cut of the distinction between traditional development assistance and non-traditional development assistance, comparing uh, the beginning of last decade with uh, the latest uh, data point available in 2009. First of all, the total envelope between uh, traditional and non-traditional development assistance has increased triple in, in the last decade, from roughly 50 billion uh, in 2000 up to 173 billion <coughs> in 2009. But it's not only a matter of the um, of the increase in the total envelope of development assistance, but it's also a matter of changes in the composition uh, of development assistance. Non-traditional development assistance, all the bars bar, <coughs> but the, dark, the darker green uh, bar, which is traditional development assistance, has increased from 8% in 2000 up to 30% in 2009. And just to give a few headlines, we consider, for instance, uh, all the equivalent um, flows from uh, non duck donors. These flows were 2.5 billion in 2000 and are roughly 11.5 uh, billion in 2009. In the case of philanthropic assistance, and these are flows uh, based on uh, uh, US figures, these were 3 billion in 2000. And our estimates that are more conservative than the Hudson figures for 2009 are roughly 25 billion. So there are, there are kind of visible increase in the, in the size of non-traditional development assistance flows. So moving now into the methodology and uh, our case study research, I mean, this is a kind of analysis from the partner country perspective. And we believe we needed to understand uh, the priorities and the challenges in managing these flows at country level, and we identified the case study methodology, the most appropriate one for this. And we chose three countries, Cambodia, Ethiopia, <coughs> and Zambia. You might ask why. Uh, in terms of the kind of um, their volumes uh, um, of development assistance as a share of, GD of GDP, they're more or less in the middle of the distribution of all developing countries. Uh, and in particular, we wanted to kind of have, even uh, with this kind of small sample, to have a sort of representative sample in terms of regions, Asia and Africa, uh, income level, uh, middle uh, and mm, low income uh, countries, as well as in terms of resource <coughs> endowment and, and fragility. So in terms of the methodology, next slide, please. Um, we consider a mixed method approach. Uh, basically, we had uh, a desk space reviewed here in London, and then we had also a country <coughs> visit uh, for two weeks where we interviewed the uh, key stakeholders, in particular, government officials, uh, representatives of duck donors, <coughs> uh, uh, civil society organization, and providers on non-traditional development assistance. <coughs> in terms of the real methodology that we followed, uh, we had uh, a sort of combined approach uh, from uh, uh, the analysis of Ray, uh, Fraser and Whitfield, they based essentially uh, the analysis of aid agreements on aid negotiations and not necessarily on a kind of more traditional principal agent analysis. In other words, they suggested that the context in terms of uh, e economic, political and governance context shape uh, negotiation capital and in turn shape negotiation strategies. And we also leverage on the Austrian framework, uh, the institutional analysis and development framework. And in particular, we used the 
the identification of the arenas in this kind of aid negotiations, and in particular, how contexts shape uh, behavioral interactions. We didn't look mu very much at the kind of role of, uh, um, of incentives as in the traditional framework. And now looking at the case studies. <coughs> this is really just a, a, a representation of how the non traditional and non-traditional development assistance flows have evolved <coughs> over time in our three case studies. All in all, uh, the total envelope has increased. Uh, we have spikes for the mid-2000, mainly due to the effects of that relief for Ethiopia and Zambia. But the envelope has increased and also the composition uh, uh, has evolved over time uh, with different uh, kind of speed. I mean, in the case of Cambodia in 2009, nearly one, one quarter of total assistance uh, was non-traditional development assistance, uh, the less so in the case of uh, Zambia and Ethiopia. I'm saying roughly 10% of, to of the total envelope. So these are very conservative figures. Uh, some of the flows are very difficult to be tracked, especially uh, flows uh, from non-traditional duck donors, in particular those that are kind of less uh, concessional than others and meet uh, uh, our criteria. But uh, these are just the kind of a, an idea to show you that these flows are becoming more and more important. But probably now we move into the kind of key findings uh, from the three case studies. On to you, Romilly. Great. <coughs> Thank you, Annalisa. Um, <coughs> so essentially, apart from the, the, the quantitative findings that Anna Elisa has um, uh, just highlighted, there were sort of six main messages that, that came out from the case studies, which are summarized up here, and now I'm going to move on fairly quickly in the interest of time to go through those um, one by one. Um, the first um, finding, which is perhaps not all that surprising, was that actually countries really valued the additional finance and the additional choice uh, that the new flows brought. I asked at the beginning, you know, was it a big challenge for countries to manage the new landscape? Was it a big opportunity? And I think the balance was that actually countries really welcome uh, the, the fact that they have new finance um, and that they have much more choice. In all of the countries, there has been quite a big uh, push on raising additional <coughs> resources. In Ethiopia, for example, the national development strategy has a very strong emphasis on infrastructure and traditional odour is simply not sufficient to meet the, the, the needs. So they very much welcome uh, the new flows. Interestingly, countries weren't um, a very, didn't put a very strong emphasis on reducing aid dependency, which contrasts to some of the, the, the other literature that's around. Um, most of the time when they thought about aid dependency, it was more about the push factors uh, around that in, insofar as Zambia is seeing reductions in aid from DAC donors because now a middle-income country. Um, Cambodia is also expecting to become a middle-income country in the next few years and is expecting aid to fall. But it's more they were planning around that contingency um, rather than actually having a big push saying we want to become less uh, dependent on aid. We also found that there was a limited concern about debt sustainability in all three countries. <coughs> all three of them have been rated by the IMF as having a low risk of debt uh, distress, um, often because they've had recent uh, debt relief initiatives. Um, but when we talked to officials around debt management, they seemed very unconcerned about uh, the volume of, of new loans that they were taking on. And Matthew may reflect a little bit on the sort of debt implications of, of some of these new trends in his uh, remarks a bit later. As I mentioned in the introduction, we were very keen to understand what the country priorities were when it comes to the sort of terms and conditions, the kind of quality of the flows that countries receive. And the headline message here was really that ownership, alignment and speed were the key things that came out particularly so in Ethiopia and Cambodia. Zambia was, uh, had a sort of wider set of priorities around much more similar to the, the Paris Declaration agenda. But for the other two countries, these were, were pretty key. Um, the progress, the, the emphasis on speed in Ethiopia was so important that actually they gave examples of rejecting more concessional loans in favor of less concessional loans just because the less, less concessional loans could turn up more, more quickly, uh, which I thought was very striking. Issues around fragmentation and coordination, interestingly, did not really come up when we asked countries about their, their priorities. So certainly the sort of balance between you know, additional fragmentation and more choice, countries seem to be very much in favor of, of, the, of, the, of the choice. Um, the non-DAC donors scored well actually against all three criteria. 
Um, as is often, uh, is as quite well known, non-DACs tend to have lower levels of conditionality. That was really uh, welcomed. Uh, they tended to be better aligned to the country's sectoral priorities. In Cambodia, for example, in 2006, the transport sector was very underfunded in relation to the social sectors because most of the DAC donors were engaged in the social sectors. Um, two years later, the transportation sector was fully funded and 80% of that difference came from China. Uh, so it's quite dramatic, the contribution that uh, China and other non-DACs are making to sectoral alignment. Um, on terms of the global funds, there was a less positive picture, particularly around alignment. Um, we found in both Cambodia and Zambia uh, that there were lots of concerns about parallel reporting mechanisms, poor alignment, um, parallel systems for the, the global funds and some of the philanthropic funds as well in, in, in Zambia. So it's a mixed picture between the different groups of, of non-traditional providers. We did find that countries are taking quite a strategic approach to managing assistance from both groups of providers. As Annalisa has said, the focus was our of our study, the methodology was very much around negotiation. So seeing the process of engagement with between donors and countries as one of negotiation. And we found particularly in Ethiopia and Cambodia that they're being quite strategic in terms of how they manage uh, their traditional and non-traditional donors. Um, and that there's also some evidence in both of those countries that they are using the presence of non-traditional donors to bolster their bargaining power with the traditional actors. Um, in Cambodia, for example, um, the country is starting to reject conditionality, uh, for example, uh, cancelling the Cambodia Development Corporation Forum, which is where they discuss conditionality and progress to, uh, towards meeting conditions. Ethiopia has also got quite a heterodox uh, set of policy prescriptions compared <coughs> to what is normally involved in donor packages. And again, there was some suggestion that they're able to do that because they have support from, from China. It was less true of Zambia. Um, we think that's probably because Zambia is more focused towards the private sector. It's a middle-income country. Actually, development assistance is just generally less important in Zambia than in the other two countries. But they certainly didn't seem to be quite as strategic in how they were managing the flows as, as, as the other two. We found that um, new actors are not very much engaged in aid coordination mechanisms. I think this is consistent with other studies. But interestingly, we found that there wasn't a strong push, again, in Ethiopia and Cambodia, there wasn't a strong push from the government in trying to get uh, those new actors into aid coordination mechanisms. <coughs> it seemed that actually countries prefer to engage with different actors in, in different fora rather than having everybody sitting around one um, table. And in fact, where there are statements or, or s indications about um, incorporating those actors in aid coordination mechanisms, it seems to be that that was more coming from the donor community rather than from the government. Again, a slightly different picture in Zambia. There actually seemed to be interest um, on all sides in, in getting the, the BRICS, particularly in those coordination mechanisms. And that seemed to be partly personality related as, as far as we could work out at the country level. Um, Interestingly, we found that the volume of philanthropic and private flows at country level was very small. Uh, for example, in Zambia, philanthropy came out at less than $1 million per year, compared to um, uh, uh, traditional aid of about a $1 billion a year. So, I mean, absolutely minuscule. The others, not quite so dramatic figures, but, but, but in the same sort of ballpark. I think they're only sort of 1% to 3% to in the other three countries. So it's quite an interesting disjuncture between the global figures we have on philanthropy and the country level picture. This may partly be to do with data problems. Um, the country level data is only for US foundations. We don't have good information on European foundations, but certainly that was a, a, a pretty striking finding. <coughs> And then um, we did look at climate finance as one of our non-traditional flows, and we found that the ability of countries to attract and strategically use climate finance very much depended on how far they were um, and how much they had uh, developed their own strategies. Uh, you had a, a sort of, at one end of the spectrum, you had Zambia, in which climate finance is relatively new. They didn't have an overarching, coherent strategy for climate finance. Um, at the other extreme, you have Ethiopia, which has a much clearer strategic plan and had been much more successful in, in framing their objectives. 
relating to, to climate finance. So it seems to be very much dependent on what uh, countries are able to, <coughs> to manage. So, in conclusion, sort of six main messages, I guess, to take away from the report. First of all, non-traditional development assistan assistance does now seem to be sizable in relation to traditional assistance. It's about 30% uh, in 2009, as Annalisa said, is also growing very fast. It's grown tenfold over the period 2000 to 2009. <coughs> um, we, do, we would like to do further work to confirm these figures, but that's provisionally what we found. Secondly, as I mentioned, countries do seem to be welcoming the choice that this brings, and they're also being quite strategic about how they manage new flows. So on balance, there seem to be more positives than negatives at country level. Thirdly, we it may be that traditional donors find their aid less popular and or they find conditionality less effective in future. We saw that certainly in, in, in Cambodia and to some extent in the other two countries. So that's perhaps something for the traditional donor community to to think about. Um, I think there is a potential challenge to the standard aid effectiveness agenda. It partly depends on how you understand it, but certainly the issues around coordination, harmonization, fragmentation didn't emerge as strong priorities at country level, and I think the, 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 the growth of non-traditional actors is, is probably uh, putting that under further challenge. Um, related again to aid coordination, the exclusion of the non-DACs from the country level coordination mechanisms may weaken those mechanisms, but at the same time, I think the fact that they're enabling countries to take a bit more uh, stronger ownership and be a bit more strategic is quite positive. And the final caveat to note is that this is really based on three country case studies. Uh, we're very interested to hear from our Rwandan colleague later um, as to whether these resonate in, in, in Rwanda, but we would be very keen to um, to do further work to basically confirm these findings because it's a fairly limited sample at the moment. Great, thank you very much indeed.